And we're live! Hello everyone and welcome to episode 9 of Beyond Retro. I am Joe Amato and I'm here with Tyler Baker. And Tyler, we got some people in the chat room. We got JSP waiting. We got Motu Cave Dweller. And hell, we got Bob Saget here. So hey, Bob Saget, Bob Saget. we got Bob Saget. Yeah, good morning, Saget. good morning, San, San Diego. I think it's or yeah, I think it's what it was in Full House. There you go. Now they're already pumped up. They're already talking about some of you know some of their greatest memories of wrestling and everything. But well, that's what we'll be getting into in just a couple minutes. So how are you doing, anyways? You all set for this episode? All set, and just like to say that uh, we won't be joined by Mr. Kennedy this evening. He found it to be a little bit more enjoyable to burn the midnight oil than sit back and talk say by the bell or wrestling or, or or other great things he decided out of the hell with you guys stick it up your ass i'm gonna go work overtime here tonight there you go yeah i guess we found out what his real priorities are so yeah he's too good yeah, for yeah, it. it's not not reminiscing about you know the the best of times it's uh you know making making he's, he's been bought by the million dollar man he's all about the bucks <laughs> yeah there you go no but yeah he'll be back but yeah i mean hell you know how it is it's holidays overtime for people in places so yeah you know life comes into play a lot of times and yeah but he will be back so for those of you maybe wondering where nathan's at you know he'll be back he's just yeah he's he's got he's still working on it was unavoidable so we he he made chime in while we were recording just to uh just to cuss about some random thing i have no (laughs) idea don't don't be surprised if it if we get a message while we're recording that you know he, he's, he's at his wit's end right here, like a nuclear bomb go off in Christiansburg, which is about 15 <laughs> minutes from where I'm at right now. Yeah, there you go. But no, it's just, well, we're getting close to like, you know, the time of the year. It's, a, you know, getting close to Thanksgiving next week. And we know Thanksgiving always has, you know, Survivor Series for the wrestling. Survivor Series. There you go. Oh, wait, who autographed that? What was the name on there? Jake the Snake Roberts. Oh, no shit. That's pretty cool. That's cool, man. There you go, the Hulkamaniacs. It's just, I mean, we're not just going to talk about Survivor Series. We'll just talk about 80s wrestling. But, I mean, of course, Survivor Series gets you going because, you know, hey, there's going to be a Survivor Series coming up this weekend for WWE. And, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong. I still enjoy wrestling, but it just ain't the same like it used to be. I don't. I, mean, I enjoy it. I, don't enjoy it. <laughs> I was like, I don't want shit. Shit. I don't care about Believe none me. of it. Not like I have, have not given – Modern wrestling, because I have watched, I guess, what what would be at the time modern wrestling, you know, from during during the, the days of the, of the Monday Night War, some of that into the 2000s, and then try to get into the modern era multiple times. And I just, you know, I don't find it as interesting, even though people who watch it will sit there and say, they like this guy. Well, give that guy a chance. Well, if, if you watch this program, it's better than, better than the Raw show. Check that out. It's just... <clears throat> I kind of feel like for me, this just too little, too late, and I can always go back and watch classic stuff of WCW and of course WWF. I'm going and I will be calling it WWF on this podcast. I'm not going to be overly political and address it as its current name. Now, to me, I, I I I give double middle fingers to that name, and it will always be the World Wrestling Federation to me. So yeah, we don't have to get bleeped like when we say WWE. <laughs> You know, that doesn't have to be bleeped or anything. We don't, we're not even acknowledging the World Wildlife Fund or anything. No. So, yeah, we'll still say WWF for when it was the WWF. That's when we're. Yeah. Well, to me, it still is. I, I I've never been able to get my head wrapped around the idea. Even Roddy Piper, when he was, he was being interviewed about They Live, and he somehow the subject came up and he goes, Why do they call it? Like, I can't call it that. And the whole crowd erupted because he was, he was slamming their current name. I'm like, Hell yes. You know what kills me the most, though? I mean, I loved when they would announce the World Wrestling Federation Champion. It's like, that's gone now. It's the WWE Champion. It's like, ugh. It just sounds so flat. And, ugh. I mean, not only because there's no Howard Finkel, but I hate that the impact of when they'd say the World Wrestling Federation Intercontinental Champion, anything, when they'd say the whole title, it was intense. It's just, it's nothing now. I hate him. It's the WWE Intercontinental Champion. I don't even know. Oh, God. I don't know. That's another side rant. I just hate how it is nowadays, the names. How they and, and I don't think it's a matter of, you know, well, that was your old generation's wrestling. I mean, people, I, I think people, you know, that that decade of the 80s, and I'd say for, for the most part the entire 90s as well, because even though there, you had that kind of what's considered the dry spell of the mid-90s before the Attitude Era and the NWO era started, people still rem- remember fondly, you know, wrestlers of the mid nineties as well. And we're talking 20 years 
from the 80s all through the 90s of superstars that transcended wrestling or, I mean, or for in so many words, put wrestling on the map and, and, and became larger than life stars outside of wrestling from Hogan, you know, and Roddy Piper and Andre the Giant, you know, to The Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin. And it's, uh, it's, it's, you almost feel like they got it all so right because wrestling has been done almost the same way for so many years from, you know, keeping kayfabe and things like that. It's, it's, I mean, it may, it may be for, for younger viewers where they, you know, John Cena is always going to be like their Hulk Hogan, their, their Stone Cold Steve Austin. But I mean, we're, we're, I'm, we're very fortunate to have grown up in a time where the likes of Hogan and Macho Man and Roddy Piper, the Junkyard Dog, and Sting and Lex Luger. Warrior, the, and yeah, yeah. You know, to to have grown up in an era of watching where these guys are the heroes and amongst all the villains, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I feel very blessed. And anybody that, that did grow up and enjoyed watching from the 80s into the 90s all the way to the Monday Night Wars, it was a blessed time to be a wrestling fan, you know. Because things have just, they've changed so much. Like, you know, when you do look at, you know, you know, the real hot time of the 80s when we had it. You know, it's it's still a time when, you know, when wrestling was believable, when we believed wrestling like we believed in Santa Claus, if you will. You know, when I, I it was... I use that because I, 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 I've often felt, I, I miss that magic because, I mean, as, yeah. as Christmas approaches, I miss the magic of the excitement for Santa Claus, and I miss that of thinking that wrestling was real. Right, because yeah, you had your epitome of the good guy against the bad guy, and you always knew who the good guy was and the bad guy, and you rarely seen something that was confusing, like two good guys or two bad guys, or is this guy good this week or bad this week? It wasn't like that. You just had, And you had your names, you had your gimmicks, and, and the first time when you seen good guys go after one another you know, in a big main event, like when you seen Hogan and Warrior, it's like, wait, what's going on? These are the two biggest baby faces in WWE. WF, what is happening? But it was still cool. But no, like you said, you know, like events like Survivor Series, right on Thanksgiving, how fun it was to have Survivor Series with Thanksgiving. But like you said, the believability of it. And it's like it started changing to, you know, like, you know, when they started, like you said, kind of letting things out of the bag, you know, saying, okay, it's, yes, it's scripted, but yes, they're still getting hurt. They're still performing. They're still putting their lives on the line. Of course they are. But, you know, they were kind of saying, okay, well, now it's kind of like a soap opera for guys. And so things, how they changed there was when you started seeing, now that you weren't believing as much as you did in the 80s, when you had WCW with, you know, Monday Nitro and then WW, you know, F for E then or whatever with Raw. It's like now it was no longer the internal like hey, conflict with. Hey, look, look, we have a surprise guest during during our, our promo here. Wait a we, second. How we, the hell did this we, happen? Uh, am I coming through OK? The reception here is terrible. Are, are, are you like in Mick Foley's, you know, boiler room area or something like that? Where, where, where are you? Where do you contact I'm, uh, I'm actually in the uh, Dungeon of Doom right now. Holy right. hell. The Taskmaster's got to be roaming around somewhere. Hot. <laughs> so, are you, so are you on lunch break? I, I am... Uh... Okay, well, well... He's actually on the clock here, people. Oh, look at this. <laughs> look at this. Just say, as long as nobody... Seizure live, but no. So we were, yeah, we were talking about some of the stuff of you know, like how it was with, uh, wrestling in the eighties, and then eventually, it, the exciting thing became basically the Monday Night Wars. Then that was the new thing, you know, because you had Raw going against Nitro, and that was the new, you know, I guess if you will, kind of conflict. But once you know Vince McMahon bought it all out and has everything, it just seemed like there was no. No competition. You know, there was something fun about having another brand to watch and compare and enjoy this, enjoy that. You wonder, will one of them show up on this show and one on that show? And like I said, wrestling is just, for me, has just changed so much. It's like, I don't know, some of that excitement. Like I said, the first, the magic of the 80s is gone, of the believability, like when you were a kid. The fun of the competition of the 90s, that hot time, or, you know, once it started getting towards the late 90s, like when when was the super hot times of the Monday Night Wars? When did that all go on? That would have been 98, 99, and probably into... A little bit two, of... Two, two, yeah. 2001 to, yeah, 2002, and then you could probably officially call yeah. the era, you know, over. And that's what I meant. And once that was over, it's like, 
Uh, wrestling just is, uh, it's kind of there. It's still fun, but it's just, it is nowhere like it will be. So that was my quick rant of it, Tyler's. But Nathan, if you heard anything, what were some of your good memories of remembering wrestling in the 80s? Um, uh, real quick, because I'll probably have to jump off after this because they need me. Okay, go ahead. Um, honestly, uh, one of my favorite things was uh, WrestleMania 6. Is that when Hogan dropped the title to Warrior? Yeah. I'm just trying not to like be seen by anybody right now, but <laughs> yeah, whatever. Um, yeah, that one, that one was probably uh, one of my favorites because uh, yeah, again, a lot, and I really liked Warrior. And to see the two of them wrestle each other, I was like, oh, because I was, like, oh, who's gonna win and who should I root for? And ultimately, I was like, ah, Warrior, of course. Good man, good man. Uh, I'm clearly outnumbered. I'm focused on that match. <laughs> But I, I, no, I, just, just um, we watching it together because I, 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 I can imagine both Nathan would have been busting my balls like at age six, and Joe would have been like, Hey, yeah, that's right, you know, just kind of edging them on. Oh, I, oh, shit, yeah. what a, I feel like we're ha- we have uh, Nathan coming from like it's like the Blair Witch or something with this angle, this point of yeah. view, and he's walking, yeah. yeah, reality TV shows. He's like wandering around like a haunted warehouse, you know, telling us what he's seeing here. Oh, I mean, I mean it's uh. It, it, it's the worst. I'm not gonna lie. You probably shouldn't <laughs> tag me in this video when it goes up on Facebook later either. <laughs> oh, I I loved wrestling as a kid. I'll just get all this out. Loved wrestling as a kid. Um, took a couple years off between like '93, '95. Got back into it when Hogan joined the NWO, and I have sort of stuck with it ever since. Like I've always actively now, but I still kind of keep up with it on the internet. Um. I think the style of wrestling is better now. Booking and the characters that you know, that's definitely prime like eighties goodness. I, I kinda wish they would go more to like letting the characters uh be who they were in the mid nineties, like taking their personalities and turning it up to eleven, but uh, you know, everything. So like you said, there's not really much that can be done at this point. But I guess on this note, I'm gonna leave you guys to it. I'm glad I could pop in for like five. That's awesome for you I mean, to make an appearance like that, though. That, that's pretty cool. Like, like he's up on the Titan Tron, giving us like a message before you know we get back to the ring here. He made an appearance just like a wrestler would out of nowhere. Like, where in a second? Who is that? So that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, uh, my run in is done. I'll see you guys later. All right, see you later. All right. Thanks, Nathan. Thanks for joining us for that quick shot. But uh, okay, well, I wanted to say something. I want to address uh, Motu Cave Dweller. He's in the chat room, and he said for him, he said it was the 1992 Royal Rumble Flair winning the title. Heenan was gold on commentary. You know what's funny about that Royal Rumble that I really remembered? Now, if I'm not mistaken, I, I want to make sure I'm right. That was where you had Flair, Sid Justice, and Hogan as being like yeah. pretty much last week. I'll tell you what. This was – I remember watching that live because I was rooting for Sid like crazy. I wasn't a Hogan hater. I just love Sid. He had a new look. I was like, okay, this is the new dude. It's going to be Sid. And when he, uh, when Hogan got thrown over by Sid, because I think Sid threw out Hogan, correct? I want to make Sid sure I'm – Hogan, and then Hogan kind of helped. That's what I hated. I hated that when he threw him out, I remember the crowd was going bananas. They're screaming. They were cheering for Sid. And then – Hogan grabbed his arm and then helped and flared. I thought, I was like, wait a second. That's cheating. What the heck happened? How could Hogan do that? He should have, like, that should have been legal. I remember being so pissed. But then I do remember that when they were, like, showing footage on, like, you know, WWE TV, you know, or WWF TV, eventually, they put in fake sound bites. They made it seem like when Sid Vish, or Sid Justice threw Hogan out, that they were booing him. And then when Hogan grabbed Sid and got thrown out, then there was cheers. I was like, oh, that was that fake WWF audio editing. I hated it because I was like, no, I watched that live. I remember how it was. They were cheering for Sid, booing Hogan. But that's when I started hating things with the Royal Rumble then. It's like now they say nowadays they're like, oh, Royal Rumbles, you know, they're always no disqualification. Because I'm like, wait a second, if you're thrown over the top rope, you get the hell out of here. What is it now they're coming back? They can come into the ring. They can throw somebody out. It's like, hey, there's no disqualification. I was like, when did this happen? Was this because that stupid thing that happened with Hogan and Sid and they went with it? I don't know if you've seen that wrestling lately, but I can't stand this new no disqualification. I always think, no, if you're thrown out, 
You're done. You get the hell out. It takes away the fun when you have somebody now come in the ring that's been thrown out to throw somebody who's in the ring legally out. I'm like, what's the fun of that? I don't know if you've noticed this, but that stuff annoys the hell out of me. Uh, I mean, they've always kind of bended the rules a little bit. And I think a lot, I'm sure some of it, like a prime example is Macho Man. Forgetting the rules, I think I forgot. Uh, I forgot how many. It was at least two Royal Rumbles where he eliminates himself because he's wrapped up in wrestling with Jake the Snake Robert. I forget who who else was. And I and I remember this because Bacha Mania has, has has displayed these too. And and, and one of them where 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 Jake is or where Jake and Macho Man are going at it. Macho eliminates himself trying to contain the fight. Undertaker comes out from comes from under under the ropes to get Macho back in the ring because he wasn't supposed to eliminate himself. They're just kind of okay. Look, you can't do that. You're supposed to. Then he jumps over the ropes again, and Undertaker comes back after him again to grab him and throw him back in the ring after he fighting him and the rest because they're telling him, you're not supposed to be eliminated yet, you idiot. <laughs> so I think uh, like so many, you know. It's just you can just kind of roll with it because, um, I, I forgot which interview it was, but um, on the kayfabe commentaries where there, I, I can't remember which wrestler it was, but they asked, you know, going into a Royal Rumble, you're supposed to remember, you know, how long you're supposed to be in, what who is supposed to what, like you're supposed to be eliminated after once the honky tonk man is eliminated, that means your number's up and you have to be the next one out of the ring. That's a lot of stuff to memorize, so I can imagine when you've got. Because it's always more fun when you've got a whole horde of guys in the ring as opposed to three, four, maybe six. When you have like 10, 12 guys in there, it's a lot of chaos. So I, I'd imagine it's a lot to remember that – remember your cue. You take a break. You're supposed to stay in a lot long. I mean, all this stuff these guys are supposed to memorize. You know, it's it, – I guess what I'm getting at, you're going to see mistakes at sure. times. You know, so – but I, I think for the most part, you didn't have anything royally, you know, screw up like the one with, uh, um, I think it was Batista and John Cena, I think, screwed up the finish in that one. And that's when Vince McMahon came down to the ring and tore his kneecap up. Um, <laughs> or, or uh, And I, I've never dug deeper. I just took it as it was a great finish to it. But was the Royal Rumble where Luger and Brett both go over at the same time. And there was that great debate who hit the ground first. And as a kid, you know, I just took it that, you know, that was, oh my God. They're like, they went at the same time. They were, they were, they were, they were, it was a stalemate. They were just, you know, neck and neck. When I, it may have been just a, 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 I can't remember if that was a mix up or not. Some wrestling fans, I'm sure they can probably correct that one. I, that one, I've just accepted it as it was a great finish for. I've never decided to go back and look at, was that a, a mess up of some kind? Yeah, there was. There's a lot of fun things, like you said, things that you wonder, what are mess-ups, what anticipation? You know, like, talk about the Survivor Series. I remember when they had the whole anticipation of the – well, first, I'm going to talk about one goofy thing. The giant egg of your one, what the hell is going to happen? Oh, uh, you really want to go right to the worst? I'm going right to it. I'm going right to it. You remember how just the anticipation, what in God's name could be in this? And out pops this gobbledygook, and you're, you're like – what? There was nothing exciting. I mean, the crowd's booing. They're trying to jazz it up with Mean Gene dancing with them in the ring at one time. It's like, who thought this was a... Br I mean, well, obviously we know who it was, but why would you think that'd be a brilliant idea to hype up something? You're, of course, you're thinking maybe some cool wrestler will debut. Something that's going to happen. And you have come... Out comes this gobbledy. I've never understood why thought they thought that was a genius move. That was... Oh, that was the biggest point or disappointment in Survivor Series history for me was that damn gobbledygooker. I think, I, from what I can recall, Bruce Pritchard had said that the the logic behind it was like kind of creating like a mascot for kids to take pictures with, and oh god, and it kind of just being this this kind of like a Mickey Mouse kind of character for the WWF was the idea behind it that in Vince's eyes, kids were going to be lining up to get their picture taken with the gobbledygooker. And <laughs> so and I, I remember when I saw that because, as Joe well knows, I saw a lot of the stuff on VHS and they gradually got to understand the TV schedule where I could catch wrestling on TV. But most of the stuff I saw at an early age was all uh, on, on VHS. And when I, in the, the 1990 Survivor Series the, where the Gobbledygooker shows up, <laughs> I, I, and I remember when I watched it for the first time, I thought, 
you know, I, I don't care about this. Not to mention there wasn't a single reaction from the crowd. No, it was just it it was crickets. Like I mean, you could you know you could hear Gene you know fall down in the ring. You could you know it was just you know no, nobody. And how embarrassing it had to have been for Gene to have to go out there and try to sell this thing as if this is as great as the power of Hulkamania you know, to this audience that was expecting God knows what. Yeah, it's just know. like that's a read. It's just I think you know anything could have been better than that. But yeah, that was one letdown. But no, just the the magic of the '80s Survivor Series. And like you said, you know, just going on a little bit further. But when they had their names, you know, the Team Warriors, the Ultimate Warriors, and you know, you had the Hulkamaniacs, you had the four by fours. I mean, room the, 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 the King's Court. Oh. You know, the natural disasters and. How, you know, like, how pumped did you get? I always remember, I loved when Survivor Series would come, because I remember the first one, they'd always say, you know, something like, teams of five strive to survive. And then eventually it went down to four, and then three, and then, I don't know what to start, I mean, what started happening in the Survivor Series, and it's like, okay, are we ever going to have all these big matchups again of multiple teams? It's like, you'd be lucky if you had one big team against another than just other matches. See, like that, said, that's made the 1990 Survivor Series so special to me, is arguably the best, aside from the 89 one, which holds a special place in my heart. But all, this one does too, but to to have logic um, to build up to this grand match of survival where all the heat, you know, babyface survivors will be on the same team and all the heels will be on the same team. And it was just more about like building up to can you can you last? Can you be the top of the heat? Can you be the best of the best? And yeah. there was no title on the line. There was no reward at the end. It was more about just and from a child's eyes, you're seeing these guys if like they can really survive. They can make it all the way to they can wrestle in their initial match. And make it all the way to the end, and not get eliminated by the visionaries and million dollar man. I, I, you know, I think what made it even cooler is we're pretty much spoiled nowadays with wrestling. I mean, we have so many different wrestling programs; they're all faces. Back then, you would have your face wrestle the jobber like on you know superstars of wrestling or whatever program you'd watch so you would always build up for these big gigantic pay-per-views which were wrestlemania the royal rumble SummerSlam, and survivor series those you only got these four so when you got to see all your faces then together on a team it was like some crazy dream like to see like you know some of my favorites like the ultimate warrior the texas tornado and the legion of doom it's like oh my god they're all on the same team you know because they got face paint these got face paint and, and i always thought texas tornado looked yeah, like the a and i mean they, it was it was a it was a perfect team which is yeah. who they wrestled the perfect team Exactly, because for me, the Texas Tornado always reminded me of, like, a smaller Ultimate Warrior, but he looked like him. So I was like, oh, my God, this is just, like you said, it's the perfect team, even though it's not the perfect team named. But it's like, for me, it was so cool to see all of them. But that's what made those Survivor Series so magical, was seeing all the best of the good guys and bad guys going against each other. You know, that, big and the promos that you're talking about, like at the beginning, the introduction of, with Vince McMahon, I, I, you know, that's one thing I can always give Vince McMahon credit for was his, his narration for the introductions for the, for the pay-per-views and things was, was second to none. And for him to sit there, you know, team captains, ultimate warrior and Mr. Perfect join forces with the Texas tornado animal axe, hawk smash. You know, and then the, the banners of the team come, and it, it's just the beautiful Survivor Series logo going through each team with Hulk Hogan, you know, in Earthquake. And oh, I, I, that I probably would have to say Survivor Series is probably my favorite. I mean, I don't know. I love the Royal Rumble so, and I, I hold these two higher than WrestleMania. I just, I just do. I, WrestleMania is, it's the pinnacle, I know, but to me, me personally, Survivor Series, because of these early Survivor Series pay-per-views and the Royal Rumble itself, to me, the, it's the... There's a different the, with... The, yeah, because the gimmicks, you're right, because yeah. WrestleMania, sure, WrestleMania has like the big epic matches, championship matches. Or what but, should be the big yes, match. Yes, or should be, but... 
when it was Survivor Series, I mean, it was, again, it was like that holiday time. It was fun to see these matchups. Like you said, it was gimmicks, but it was fun to see all the goods and bads and teaming up and who's going to team with who. Then when you think about the Royal Rumble, the whole gimmick was that Royal Rumble. You're like, oh, my God, who's going to be number two? Who's going to be three? You waited, you know, like three, two, one. And here it comes, like, you got so excited. I still remember the first time Demolition. It's like when you've seen, I think it was Axe that came out first, maybe, yeah, or Smash. Axe. Smash. Yeah, when you heard the Demolitions music, they said, no, number two. And it went, dun, 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 dun. and I was like, oh my God, that's Demolitions music again. It was like that kind of stuff, that magic and those moments. It's like, those were what made Royal Rumble so fun too. So it's like, like you said, that was exciting for those gimmicks, the gimmick of the whole battle, you know, Royal Rumble itself, the Survivor Series matches. And then SummerSlam was fun, but I didn't go bananas and wrestle. Um, I, I really can't say I rented many summer slams, if at all, and, and it's main, mainly based on what was available too. I didn't see a whole lot of the summer slams that I would have liked to have seen available to rent, yeah. but survivor series and Royal rumble were pretty accessible at my local video stores for me to go and rent. And I would rent the same ones. I remember one time I was so stoked over watching the 1990 survivor series. I went back and watched the 89 one. And thought, okay, I didn't watch it till you know the complete end. Like even after Warriors match, maybe there's a grand match of survival on that that I just wasn't aware of. So I sat and watched the entire pay per view again, hoping there was a grand match of survival, and then just went to black. And I, I could not have been more disappointed in myself. I was just like, oh god, <laughs> you know, I, I just one... seeing see Hogan and Warrior and Tito Santana team up against the uh, Warrior. I mean, a uh, million dollar man, the Visionaries. It was, it was, oh man, it was just so exciting. And the, the promo they cut before the match. And, and as they're talking about that, so far it's just the ultimate war on one side and, and the million dollar man of the vision is on the other. You know, it's looking a little lopsided. I mean, to the hype for this grand yeah. match that Hogan wins and Santana wins. And, right. you know, God. It's just, it's that stuff it is so exciting. You can relive, like I said, you can just constantly relive it. I will admit, SummerSlam though did have some very great moments. It, like for it, me, it, don't, don't get us wrong. No, and SummerSlam was like WrestleMania, but yeah. I, in comparison, I always felt like Survivor Series always offered you something different. Oh sure, Royal Rumble was so exciting, and then of course I liked King in the Ring too. And that was different King when it Ring, came, which unfortunately is just something that's thrown away on Raw for free, and I, as opposed to building up to this epic tournament. Yeah, that used to be fun. I will say one thing from SummerSlam I always remember is when the Honky Tonk Man, remember when he... Oh, oh of you, course oh, you're Oh, yeah, that talk. part, because I remember, you know, when, when he was like, oh, hey, anybody in the back there, you know, bring anybody out, I'll wrestle whoever, or however he said. And I remember Superstar Billy Graham said, oh, you better be careful, brother. There's a lot of people back there. And I remember thinking... I don't think they announced the Ultimate Warrior for being on Summer saying, please, please. And when that music hit, just everyone lost their shit. He came over there 100 miles an hour like he does, throwing his clothesline, shoulder tackles, pins on, takes, oh my God. That moment, I, I lost my mind, as you've seen everybody did. There was something just so nuts and intense. He had the perfect character gimmick of intensity, if you will, from his look, design, the music, his running, the shit. Oh god! But yeah, that's that moment. And I, I love Honky's re reaction and that to have been in his boots in the rain when the music hit, the roof <laughs> blows off, and he's trying to sell like, "Who is that?" You know, it it was just you know, it like, damn it, man! Honky Tonk Man does not get enough credit for being such an incredible heel. I hated him as a kid. I adore him now as as an adult wrestling fan. Like I, I him, perfect, and DiBiase. I just. I hold them in such high regard because, uh, God, I hated him so much as a kid. Oh, you man. Did. He was a very he, – he was great at being hated. Well, I want to say one he thing. He certainly was. In the chat room, Bob Saget and Motu Cave Dweller, they were talking about Tito Santana, Santana. And what's funny is Bob Saget mentioned the flying jalapeno. Oh, my God, I remember. I remember when Bobby Heenan used to call the flying forearm the flying jalapeno. <laughs> he made fun of Tito Santana so much. No, you he talking about the flying burrito elbow. Oh, dude, well, I just love, I remember when he said, oh, the flying jalapeno. And I remember the time, I think it was um, Reba McIntyre sang the National Anthem. And he was like, oh, is that a Reba McIntyre? Is that Tito's sister or cousin? He said something stupid. Yeah, that's <laughs> WrestleMania 8, I think. Yeah. Oh, shit, that's what you can't beat either. I mean, just think of the managers that now, which are nothing compared but to back then. That's what I mean. I mean, oh, well, all we have is Paul Heyman as the advocate for Brock Lesnar. That's nothing. Bobby Heenan. No, that doesn't count. Yeah, Bobby Heenan is 
he's like I said, he's so iconic of being a manager that you know you wanted to hate, but then a commentator that you absolutely loved. You loved him on primetime wrestling or wherever else he commentated. I mean, he would talk about people in the crowd, calling them names. It's nobody can beat Bobby Heenan. That's just my God. And plus, how he would just demean the wrestlers also. I miss Bobby Heenan so much. I miss that type of commentary in that character. Man, what a great manager in person. He was, and it goes. It goes back to the magic of being a kid and watching wrestling. When you, I mean, because because what was so cool is you would see Heenan and Jimmy Hart and Slick managing several wrestlers. So you a lot of times you would see him come out with multiple wrestlers, and because because you're always oh. Bobby Heenan's come out. I, I hope Hogan kicks his ass, man. I mean, just one of those things. It, it wasn't a complete match unless the manager got his ass kicked too. I mean, which didn't happen all the time because a lot of times they get scared and run off. But it was so great if the babyface would grab a hold of that manager and throw him over the top rope or or pound him over the head or, or just something. It was how can that, that's I mean those as a kid, the six year old boy, and you're wanting this. This grown man who's the manager, you want him to be torn to pieces. You, know? <laughs> you did. It was, it was fun. And, and that's our read. I can't, I can't explain how that was with Bobby. How could he create such a character that you hate him as a manager but loved him as commentary? I just I remember me and my mom loved hearing him com- doing his commentary on primetime wrestling anywhere else. But as a manager, boy, you hate him. Especially, again, another match I remembered was when the Ultimate Warrior was defending his Intercontinental belt against Ravishing Rick Rude. And he was suplexing oh, him yeah. from the outside of the ropes inside. And Bobby grabbed his leg, remember, and was holding down. And then I think that's when Rick Rude took the belt. Oh, my God. I'm screaming at the yeah. TV, hating, cussing at Bobby Heenan. Uh, just – Man, it's just that magic. I, I can't say that that magic and that. Type oh, of it, the, those, those guys, have. especially like Rip, Ravishing Rick Rude, if they're managed by Bobby Hannon, it just intensified the amount of evil that these human beings immensed. You know, if, if you saw Bobby Hannon rock one, doesn't matter who it was. If the if the guy selling popcorn was being escorted to the ring by Bobby Hannon, that guy is public enemy number one. You know, <laughs> don't know anything about him, and say, and Jim Cornette did the same thing. God, I hated Jim Cornette as a kid. Oh, man. I mean, I the pro- Jim. probably Jim Cornette and Bobby Heenan were almost neck and neck for me as a kid. And then Jimmy Hart and Slick would have been right below that. Jim, well, that was the thing. Jimmy Hart was really annoying to me, especially with that megaphone, because I know when that yeah. would come oh. into play and if they if they used that as a weapon, I just I hated him. But you know what's funny? Slick, it's like I almost couldn't hate the guy, even when he was the bad. I mean, of course, when he's a bad manager, I was like, I still like Slick. I couldn't hate the guy. And it was funny. In the chat room, Motu Cave Dweller was mentioning him. Do you remember? Oh, I'll never forget when there was that whole ritual that he mentions about turning the one man game gang into, into a candy. King- Dream. African dream. It's like, oh my! It looks a long. That was Instead a long. Instead of doing like the hand drive and stuff, and <laughs> I, I had Hasbro figure of a king, the African dream. I got it for my birthday when I think when I was six. What were they thinking? And that was a long vignette of they did to have this whole built up. It's like, it's like that's the one man. Uh, you, I, I don't know. I don't watch those shoot interviews, but I always wondered if the guy who portrayed one man gang ever spoke about his thoughts of being a king. I'm sure. African. I'm pretty sure he has been interviewed, but I, the, that that's a gimmick that I was never. You know, look, I mean, to me, it, it, as a kid, I didn't see stupid and cool. I saw good and evil. As an adult, I s- still look back on Akeem as like, I get it. You know, I mean, yeah, it may look silly, but I mean, I get it. It's the one man gang. And then I remember that he teamed up with um, Boss Man to become the, the Twin Towers. Yeah, uh, yeah. I believe. So you put him next to the Boss Man. I mean, you know, it's, it looks cool. Yeah. Plus, not to mention, he was wearing kind of brightly colored African clothing. He was wearing yellow and blue. <laughs> Doesn't really say the, the heart of Africa with yellow and blue. But, <laughs> just but, but I mean, it, it's an image of seeing Slick, you know, driving to the <laughs> ring, and you had Akeem doing the hand thing. Yep. And just like uh, Bob said, he said, yeah, Jive Soul Bro, that was a funky song. I did like, yeah. I always liked that song. <laughs> Oh shit! So I mean, it, yeah, it's it's hard to find things about the '80s wrestling, especially WWF, that you you look back on and just and despise. I mean, yes, if you're going to look on something, some people are going to tear apart the style of wrestling. That more stars like 
you know, you may go after a junkyard dog for crawling around on all fours and trying to headbutt people. And yeah. it was fun, though. It, that, that was it, but it was a simpler time because you could get over based on your look and how you cut a promo. You know? Yeah, and sure, they weren't as, you know, doing as many crazy moves as nowadays. Because, yes, today, yeah. oh, my God, the amount of moves they do is nuts. But, I mean, it was a simpler and a fun time. I mean, hell, you had rock and roll wrestling, that cartoon. I mean, that was that was a great cartoon that you had. I mean, that's how hot wrestling was. They made a damn cartoon out of it. And I think that most people in the 80s probably did grow up, at least I would think, watching Hulk Hogan's rock and roll. I mean, I watched rock it whenever, and wrestling. Whenever I caught it, I watched it wholeheartedly. I, I, I was not, uh, especially because I love the intro because it actually had live footage of Hogan walking with kids. And it was exciting. And then to see, you know, Andre and Junkyard and, and um, Steamboat and Hogan against, you know, Piper and uh, Big John Studd and. Uh, uh, Nikolai and you know the wide assorted you know villains on you know that were uh, running around causing trouble and stuff. So it was the testament to how popular. I mean, I mean it, it's 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 no wonder why a lot of wrestlers in the eighties had egos the size of a planet because of the rock star appeal that they had from heroes and villains from eighty four into the nineties. I mean these guys were. I mean that they 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 were. I mean, real comic book characters come to life. I mean, to, it, it's always so. It's always been so fascinating to me for the, especially for the heels, to have to maintain character when they're traveling from town to town. You know, they may stop in and get gas. They may be approached by somebody who says, "Better not take the Intercontinental title this weekend." You know, mm-hmm. and having to, and, and and sometimes like I remember King Kong Bundy said he wouldn't be rude to kids if they came over and asked him for an autograph because he wasn't going to do that. He wasn't going to say beat it, kid. I'm going to squash Hogan too tonight. You know, he wasn't going to do that, which I think that's cool. But the idea of having to maintain the idea that, that people ask, like, no, I can't stand him. And when I see him tomorrow night, I'm going to kick his ass. I'm going to take his woman too. And uh-huh. it's It was so fascinating that everybody's building up the big Santa Claus effect. You know, that they, they're doing everything they can from grown men and women to little kids and making them all think that you know, this Sunday, Magnum TA and Dusty Rhodes are going down, you know. It's and no, like I said, it was I mean, it was very believable. I mean, they had I mean the excitement and the popularity was so great. I mean, you think they even had remember music videos like Pile Driver. I mean, that was another cool thing with seeing when they would actually do these music videos. There were so many different types of things that they did. And then when it transitioned to when we got um No Holds Barred, the movie. I remember the hype of that movie, how I was so excited, and I loved the movie. I did. I really enjoyed the movie. But when Zeus was going to come to WWF, it was like, wait, wait a second. It was freaky because he looked unstoppable. Remember, always hitting his, punching himself in that crazy eye he did. And he looked unstoppable. I think that one time, didn't he get hit by a chair? I can't remember who hit him. Was it Hogan? Somebody hit him with a chair. And it's like, it was nothing in, in when he came to, you know, WWF. But that was so believable when he transitioned. I was like, oh, my God, Zeus is coming. And he's so gigantic. He's going to kill Hulk Hogan. <laughs> It was so unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, I, and as you get older and you start kind of understanding what wrestling fans think about, Zeus was always looked down upon. Me secretly, quietly to myself, I would still enjoy watching the Hulkamanias on VHS or No Holes Barred. Of course, I went to a period where I absolutely, did, I mean, was disgusted with No Holes Barred because I just like this movie does not hold up. Now, I treasure the film. I mean, I've got a signed poster of No Holes Barred. Boom. <laughs> Yeah, you know, so but I, it's come, so it's come full circle. I appreciate, it. and plus the idea of this thing, I think this movie was made with the idea that wrestling is still real to the audience. <laughs> People who go to see this movie are under the impression that wrestling is real, yeah. which is like it's a product of its time. You know, you can't really get away with making a movie about John Cena's playing, you know, John Cena, and this weekend, you know. Edge is, is is managing this up and coming new guy to take his title and, and take the streets and all that kind of stuff. They don't make movies based on this mythology, the 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 kayfabe, so to speak. But I, I I attribute Zeus as being one of Hogan's greatest heels because of the impact of that film and seeing him team up with Macho Man. Yeah, you know, it, it was people can say what they want about Zeus. He is so fondly remembered about his run with Hogan, no matter. It, from SummerSlam to the, the the steel cage match, I mean, say what you want. The guy still to this day. 
Yeah, I mean, like I said, I mean, he was frightening, especially when it was a time when you were believing it because of how big the son of a gun was, how frightening it was. I remember when he would spit and slobber when he would talk, yeah. as, as gross as it looked. I always remember, though, it it didn't look like, um, it was always so awkward. I think it was when Hogan slammed him. It always looked weird, like Zeus well, didn't he, know how to take that. Well, the thing, too, and they, they, they said, you know, I think, I think it was right before their SummerSlam match with Beefcake Hogan, Macho Man, and Zeus. They had, I think, 48 hours to teach this actor how to get into a ring and wrestle. That's all oh, they that had. would explain it. I remember, you know how it is, you as a fan watching, you know what a slam looks like. And I always remember thinking, Yeah, wow, he, he doesn't fall looking. gracefully. He falls like 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 a rock. Like he just kind of holds holds his complete position and just, yeah. I noticed that too, but yeah. it, I didn't really look at it as a, as a fault as a kid. But, um, I mean, considering he was an actor that they brought in to portray one of Hogan's greatest heels, I think he did a pretty good job considering, you know, they didn't ask him to go out and do, you know, backflips and, you know, arm drags and, you know, he didn't even run. He didn't run the ropes. He didn't do running, you know, uh, you know, ducking clotheslines, <laughs> right, right. clothesline. he did, I mean, you know, he, he just didn't do a whole lot, but. No, he didn't. He didn't. But it, it, it's still, we're, here we are. You know, that was 1989 when that film came out and his run with Hogan. We're talking almost 30 years ago, you know, and we're still talking about Zeus. And that definitely helped put his name on the map because then anytime he would pop up in a movie, they knew him as Zeus. Lister. Yeah, Tiny yeah. Zeus Lister, exactly. Otherwise, he would never have the Zeus moniker. So we know anytime you see him, that's the thing. You see that guy, you say Zeus because you just remember no holds barred or wrestling. You know, that's Zeus. So that, that definitely kind of helped uh, his career, at least getting in some other bit parts in movies. Yeah, I mean, he's he's still doing movies to this day, and I, I I don't know if if he's still if he still uses goes by the name Zeus as an actor, but I know I know in certain movies he was he was listed as Tiny Zeus Lister. Yes, Tiny Zeus Lister. I was going to say Bob Saget in the chat room. I think he might get struck by lightning. He just said the the only thing that could hurt Zeus is an eye rake. <laughs> Cool. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, and I rake to the eyes, yeah, at least opens them up to a, a, a body slam and a couple of <laughs> Exactly. Oh, shit, but that's so, man, that was just, like I said, we could just talk about so and many that, of them. That, that alone, that's my favorite pay per view is the one that Zeus is, is with the million dollar team. Uh, I, I've watched that, that pretentious, that matches on YouTube, and I, I just watching the entrances and the face-off and it all coming down to Hogan and, and DiBiase. Um, I mean, I, I miss the names. Like we just said right there, I miss the team names because yeah. I don't think they do that currently with WWE. I don't think they do. Of course, if you want to say Team Raw against Team SmackDown. Yeah, like, I, I don't count that. You know, I, I or they'll just, you know, it's it's uh, Randy Orton's team versus Team Triple H or something. Instead of coming up with these gimmick names based off the team captain – or something that that's well, yeah. Typically, the names were, were reflected the team captain. Like Macho Man's was the King's Court, Earthquakes was the Natural Disasters. You had uh, Dusty Rhodes team was the Dream Team. You know the Four by Four, Hacksaw Jim Duggan's team, Rude Brood, and yeah, 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 yeah Rude Brood, the Vipers, the Visionaries. You know the, the Warriors, the Perfect Team. God, it was it was just extra flair and appeal to this 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 group of uh you know unusual heels teaming up you know like uh oh hell a, a boss man's uh uh because i remember man i can't believe i can't remember boss man's uh oh the enforcers the enforcers okay. yeah where it was uh akeem bad news brown honky tonk man and, and, and big boss man against the uh dusty rose dream team man oh yeah another thing you know it's <laughs> funny just talking about other moments of 80s wrestling I like I said I was never a, a hater of Hulk Hogan. I did like Hulk Hogan, but there was just times there was a, like of course I was a super Ultimate Warrior fan. But I always said I remember I, I've told you this, but I never told the fans. I remember the time Bad News Brown fought Hulk Hogan. Yeah, I was so excited because I thought Bad News Brown was gonna win. But when he said he grabbed the microphone and said, "It's Ghetto Blaster time, fool," I was like. 
know? Why did you announce it? Hogan's going to know. Because, again, that's when you thought wrestling was real. I was like, he just heard it. And then Bad News Brown did something that he'd never done. Bad News Brown usually just stood there, and he'd hit you with the standing ghetto blaster. He ran off the ropes, then came and tried to do a running ghetto blaster. And I was like, I know he's going to miss this because I've never seen this in my life. And sure enough, he missed it, and Hogan beat him. And what sucked, because I thought he was going to win, and wasn't there even thoughts, and there was plans for Bad News Brown to possibly be the champion at one time? Yeah. I think Hockey Talk Man had mentioned in an interview, too, that they, they had thought about doing a run with Bad News because of he, he would have been the first black w, uh, WWF champion at that time. And and I guess for whatever reason, they decided not to. Because for the most part, too, during the 80s, there was no heel uh, champion. I mean, at least with the, with the heavyweight title, it was pretty much Hogan and, and Macho. And then, of course, ending with Warrior. Uh, Andre got his brief stint when, you know, or, or not Andre. Well, yeah, Andre and DiBiase when they did the double cross <laughs> with the two Hebners. Yeah, yeah, I remember and for that. A legitimate, you know, win, in, you know, whether, I mean, like we were, like you used, used to see at, at a WrestleMania or something like that. Um, it, it just kind of makes you wonder why they decided not to, to put, put the heavyweight title on a, a big heel or someone like Bad News Brown, like the, yeah. the Black Power. You know, gimmick, which has been an, an, an awesome heel. I, I, I just him and Rick Rude, uh, you know, Mister Perfect. All those guys should have been given title runs. Honky Tonk Man should have been given a heavyweight title run. It would have I mean, been. I mean, it would have been cool. I, I just, I loved, I love Bad News Brown. Like I said, I love the Ghetto Blaster move. I told you when I would play pro wrestling on Nintendo. I think it was uh it was the one Japanese wrestler, um, right? I don't, know, I forgot his name, but I remember I picked him because. He would have a move that if you stood just under the wrestlers, the wrestlers coming down the ring and you hit the button, he would do like the ghetto blaster. I just remember I do the ghetto blaster and I would always say, ghetto blaster, ghetto blaster. <laughs> I, was, I, don't know, I was obsessed with that move. I love Bad News Brown and just, yeah, just those the whole times, like I said, of that wrestling and that, you know, that era, it just, it sucks that it just came to an end because it was so enjoyable. Moments like when the ultimate warrior returned to save Hulk Hogan from, you know, Sid Justice and Papa Shango. Papa Oh my God! When that music hit, I mean, you knew it was building. When they were like, one way or another, it's this is it for Hulk Hogan. This is it. And they said, this is crazy. Beefcake can't help him. He doesn't have a friend left. And that music hit. The crowd lost it. Shit! That I never heard an ovation that loud. Warrior running a hundred miles an hour. Oh my God! Damn, do I miss them days and those times? Uh, damn. And I, I, I don't think their match at WrestleMania six gets enough credit because I, I feel like people like to take shots at Hogan. They take shots at warrior because of their style of wrestling. It was still great. And uh, to me, the, the match tells a story. It's, it's a great match. It's simplistic. Yes. But it, you know, for God's sakes, it's not supposed to be chain wrestling. It's not supposed to be luchadors. They're not taking high spots off ladders like the Hardy boys. Yeah, that's their style. That's what they you were know? known for. They were just two big mega names. Yes, they didn't have the most greatest assortment of moves, but it was great to see one would get the advantage here, then the other would come to get the advantage. It was like a back and forth. It was just a seesaw the whole entire time till right towards the end when Hogan does, does his you know big boot, runs off the ropes, drops a leg, but then the warrior gets up, splashes him, gets the pin. It was just, it was a great back and forth the whole time. In fact, I remember the time there was a neighbor that gave me a um i would go over to his house because um his daughter and i went to school together and we i remember going over there and i think the next day was going to be or the next couple days was going to be a wrestlemania and i said you know of course i'm a big warrior fan he was a big hogan fan and he had the pay-per-view so I was coming over to watch it. And I remember watching that and being so excited. He was like, I'm going to tell you what, Joe. He's like, if the Ultimate Warrior wins, you're not getting rides to school no more. You're going to have to take a bus or walk. <laughs> and the Warrior won. He was like, that's it. You're walking. And would you believe the next day he made me walk? And then he started, you know, giving me a ride with his daughter again. But he hated it so much. He was so pissed that Hogan lost. He made me walk the next day to school. So. I always remember that shit. That was I, I, I took it to heart, too, because I, when I rented it, I had no idea. I, all, it was all new to me, and my brother was a warrior fan. Of course, oddly enough, my brother had no interest in watching the pay-per-view for some reason. But he, he rented No Holds Barn. I rented WrestleMania Six, So we were getting a Hogan fix, but his favorite wrestler was Warrior, but he rented a Hogan movie. Never could figure that out. Hmm. But I remember when I, when I watched it, he was outside playing, and I had to go outside and tell him, Warrior won. And 
I'm, you know, and I would think because my brother always enjoyed one up of me if he had the opportunity. That was one of the few times he just kind of seemed, huh? Like there was no emotion because he, I mean, my brother loved Warrior, adored Warrior as a kid, and I, I never could figure out why he was so, you know, unenthusiastic about that. And but I grew to appreciate that match and watch it, you know, and rent, would rent that tape. But it was it was still hard for me to watch Hogan lose as a kid. You know, I um, I it's I almost felt like like how kids today they cry if they see John Cena lose or something like that, and it's like oh it's silly. I never cried over Hogan losing, which I didn't. It it's a, I hated it. Yeah, it was but, such a great fifty fifty in that crowd because it's like you know you really couldn't boo either. No matter who you like, it's like you really couldn't boo. It's like they were still cheering this, cheering that, and we're the Warrior One. I remember how he like pushed aside the World Wrestling Federation Championship. He just grabbed his Intercontinental Belt, held yeah. it up, and so then Hogan came in, you know, kind of presented it to him. Great moment. I, yes, I it was. Learned too that apparently wrestling fans felt that Hogan was taking Warrior's moment by staying in the like staying part of the moment as opposed to getting up and leaving. No, it was like passing the but torch in a way. Kid, I thought it was iconic for him to play up that he's still a good guy here. And here's your belt. He's passing the torch. They had their the hug, their moment. And, I mean, I. I I didn't see anything that said the audience was not behind this because the crowd erupts when new, when Howard Fink you know announces new world champion. I I I love watching it. I love watching the beginning of that match and especially the end, like when the, the Hogan uh, misses the leg drop, the pin one two three, the celebration, the music kicks in. And I love the entrance of Hogan coming into the ring, Warriors standing in the uh, the opposite turnbuckle. There, you know, watch you, I love you, or something like, or something like. It's it's just epic proportions. That entire match in the Sky yeah. Dome, you know, it just you can't get any more magical than that. And and it was so cool because that was the first time we had a moment where we seen a champion have both belts to have the World Wrestling Federation Championship and Intercontinental. It was bizarre. And, of course, yeah. then, you know, he gives up the other one for, like, a tournament to however they win it. But yeah, that was so cool to see somebody having two belts. But also, again, that's the first time you've seen two really gigantic faces, good guys, going after each other. And and, yeah. and, and it was such a memorable event. I'm surprised they don't do more of that. Like, I I'd always felt that they ought to try that every so often, pitting – the the current babyface champion against a new hot and fresh up and coming babyface, and you know hype it up, make the fans pick and choose, and you know it just that's the thing though with wrestling nowadays the reason it doesn't work is because it's like you're booing the bad guy, you're you're I mean you're booing the good guy, you're cheering the bad guy, you sometimes cheer the good guy. It's like you don't even know who's good or bad, and the people they try to make good you hate anyways. It's like it just doesn't work. It it's like you don't even care. Well, that's the thing. The the the, the audience loved Warrior. They loved Hogan. And of course, Hogan wants to go make movies, so they kind of this we're gonna you know write write you off so you can do that. We'll make Warrior Champion, but it was something that the fans wanted to see. That whereas now they're all like, no, 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 you can't have Daniel Bryan. We want you to like this guy. We want you to like Roman Reigns. All right, fine, we'll give you Daniel Bryan. Oh well, he's injured. Well, that's unfortunate here. Well, we've got another big guy that Vince wants to shove down your throat. You know, it's. It's it's like I can never understand why they never gave Jeff Hardy like they they kept teasing giving Jeff the title. He would I thought he was going to get it, uh, yeah, because that dude. I mean, yeah, he he was it's super popular, super hot, you know, oh, with he, the fans. He was so and that's what I mean. That's what I mean. He's hot with the fans. He's popular. He has a cool kind of look, edge, you know, that kind of funky music. The way he moves, people are into him. It's like, yeah, I thought he was going to get it too, and of course, it never happened. But of course, you know, he you know maybe lifestyle. I mean, he got it, but it, I don't recall it being very memorable. Plus, I think by the time he got it, I just didn't care as much anymore. After he had his match with Undertaker, his match with Triple H, a match with Randy Orton, you know, it was like, okay, all Vince likes doing is just teasing everybody that, oh, yeah, I like Jeff, too. We're not going to give him the title. You know, I just felt like, why are you doing this? Why, why do you consistently keep teasing this this idea that this guy is who's extremely over more than you guys can imagine. And you're not putting the belt on him and giving him a decent run with it. And it's sad to say the only things I really get excited about are watching the women wrestling just because they're, I, I just love looking I, at them. Say that too. The, the women wrestlers have now come out of 
what was to me one of the most embarrassing things about professional wrestling because they would just get girls to run around the ring and scream while the audience is going to the toilet or getting popcorn because it was crickets. You could hear the women screaming and yelling. You shouldn't be able to hear any of that stuff. And, and nobody cared because they were not training properly to actually put on, other than Beth Phoenix, who I thought was a great wrestler. Unfortunately, she wasn't given a whole lot to play around with. You know, no, and I. Yeah, and, no, I mean, they, 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 you're right. Nowadays, I mean, they can wrestle. They put on a great show, and plus they're really good to look at. I mean, I love Alexa Bliss. My God, I love looking at her. Oh, man, I'm, I'm just waiting for Survivor Series just to just to see her. So I get excited just to, to look at Alexa and maybe some of the others. Uh, there's a couple here and there. There's Alexa Bliss. Um, you know, another one that I kind of like, you know, Alicia Fox, unfortunately, she had a good crazy – like um personality that she was going at one time they had this like crazy gimmick for and it had a she had this funky other music then her push went kind of down she has this other sucky music now it looks like they're trying to maybe re-push a crazy gimmick but i don't know sometimes i get into the looks of the characters the gimmicks the sounds and it uh she's another one but yeah i, I love seeing alexa bliss but yeah today i don't really get excited for many of the wrestlers to watch the guys it's like sometimes you want to see like, you know, a big strong dude doing something because I've seen so many damn flips and spins. It's like, okay, my brain has been, I'm desensitized. Like you mentioned traditional brawlers as opposed to everyone doing the high spot stuff. Yeah, because I'm, I'm desensitized. I've seen so many cool ass flips and spins and the red arrow move and all this other stuff. It's like, I don't know. I just want to see somebody, you know, get, you know, clotheslined, you know, and flipped in a circle, get thrown out of the ring, get power bombed 15 times or something. I, I, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's different how wrestling is because I can't get excited. Like I used to like this big boy, Braun Strowman, that's a big son of a gun. Like, you know, you want to see something like that big son of a gun with Brock Lesnar, maybe going at it. Cause those are big, strong dudes. Of course they're, you know, very limited to, well, Braun, you know, Braun Strowman, that guy can run like a, a freight train. He's super fast. He looks like he could do some stuff. Brock Lesnar, unfortunately, he's, He's limited to basically kind of just his certain moves now. He's not doing as many as he used to. I mean, hell, it, you know, he used to do a lot more athletic moves. But Well, he, he's, he's on that limited restricted schedule, so it's convenient for him as opposed to when he was up and coming, young and hungry and, you know, was a, a giant star in a very short amount of time and, you know, quickly decides to give that up to pursue a career in football. Yeah, so it's just, eh, things are different, but... Oh, Jesus, man. Like I said, we could go all day. I mean, we could always hit another thing about 80s wrestling. But that was, like I said, that's our kind of thoughts. The days of when wrestling in the 80s to somewhat into the 90s was pretty damn good. And the magic when there was magic there. And I miss the magic. Yeah, I mean, and a lot of it has to be attributed to the fact that when you're a kid, you, you're, or at least during that time when wrestling, everybody talked like wrestling was real. You'd have... My uncle Roger came in one time while I was watching The Bash at the Beach and tell me, oh, look how fake that is. No, back in my day, it was Wahoo McDaniel. Or, <laughs> you know, and I, and I remember it was, it was, I think Ric Flair had cut himself open. He's like, you know, that's fake, right? You know, he's not really bleeding. And I'm sitting there, I see blood on his face. I'm like, I don't, I don't quite understand. But, you know, part of it has something to do with, yes, being under the impression that you've always, and I don't know if youngsters today, think wrestling's real like i don't i don't know the kids that are five six seven eight nine watch wrestling and sure the parents are, well I, I well if that's i would hope that would be the case i'd hope along with santa claus that you know as a father you don't ruin professional wrestling for your kids because you know in this overly super sensitive apologizing for this we got it we've got to put a, a, a rescue blanket around everybody that that's, oh, I smelled someone's fart. I, I'm offended. Someone come and comfort and coddle me here and give me time on CNN to be interviewed about, about the, the stress that I've been under here. You know, I'd like to think that little boys and little girls who watch this are always under the impression that the baby faces and the heels are really fighting over the real heavyweight title. That if they win the Royal Rumble – that this is their one time. They did do it, man. They lasted all other 29 participants in the Royal Rumble here. And Well, when they I, show the crowd and you see some of these kids crying or looking upset, yeah, they, they still believe it. So there, there's the magic there for them. Are and, the ones who just cry over John Cena, though? Those are always funny. <laughs> there you go. So, Which I, uh, I think some people got pissed off because I, I, there used to be a time where people were posting videos of, of, of little boys crying when John Cena would lose a match like at home. 
and they start throwing temper tantrums. Like, it was just funny. It's even more funny that dad decides he's going to record his kid crying. After- <laughs> That's terrible. But it makes you think, well, what, would have, the year right there. what would have been like when we were growing up if there was all the availability or availability of cameras that quickly? You wonder what our reactions, if they would have got us. I mean, we would have been pretty I, damn- I never, I never got that upset, If which on a few occasions, Hogan would lose a match either due to a count out or like a WrestleMania four, uh, him and Andre are both disqualified. You know, I think I never rest- cried it, but I screamed. I yelled at that damn TV. I did yell. I would get. Uh, I, I don't know. Well, because you know, if I did that, my parents would probably because I'm upstairs screaming and yell at the TV. I was not a screamer and a yeller about that kind of stuff. I just, I just wasn't. I just didn't do that. I would sit quietly, watch it, and deep down in in my mind, all the emotion is raging through either with joy or anger. I remember there's one particular match on a Hulkamania, Hulkamania Forever, where uh, Hogan's wrestling the genius. He loses, I think, due to disqualification or count because Mr. Perfect interfered. I remember that. I remember that. And, and I, I was like, what the hell? In, in my mind, you know, I was quite upset by that. But I did not show any kind of physical emotion, cried, screamed, kicked anything. It was just like, man, that sucks. Of course, I'd watch I'm- Hogan every match on that tape except that one i do remember because i remember the genius was doing cartwheels and holding his hands up and celebrating yeah, doing whatever like, oh did. god it, you know it was but it was fun to be disappointed in that sense because you know you'd always want to you know hogan to get revenge at some point but I, I i just felt like but then again too that was also a time of wrestling where where fans were attacking wrestlers Threatening them with knives and guns and da- doing damage to their car. If you are a rotten heel, you better be, you know, calling a cab because your car's probably got four flat tires, two busted windshields, you know, and, you know, sugar in your gas tank because fans absolutely hated you back then. And so, you know, I guess it wouldn't be too far fetched for fans of the A's to cry when they're doing that. But <laughs> yeah. I, I, I never did anything like that. No. Oh, crap. All right, man. Well, well, that was a good episode. So uh, yeah, well, yeah, well, we'll revisit this because Nathan's a hardcore wrestling fan too, and he only got to touch on not even the tip of the iceberg of how much of a hardcore wrestling fan he is. So, we'll we'll, we'll have to do a a retrospect on like the various pay per views. Like, do you know, we could do King of the Ring, we could do the Royal Rumble itself. You know, Hell, we could even Fire talk. About, we could even talk about the great Saturday night main events. we yeah, waiting Saturday, up for and, nighttime. I have a and, lot of those stories personalities too i mean you know you've got you know the goofy ass todd pettingill who used to host the the superstar show on saturday morning on usa god i hated him as a kid yep. but i did i love saturday night's main event waiting up for that that was like your own personal pay-per-view in a way because you didn't have to pay but yeah we'll, we'll say best that. always we didn't even touch on like the lgn and the hasbro wrestling figures either you know that, well, that's, that's a whole segment in itself there's tons of stuff that's what i mean so we can save that for another episode but well do you have any closing remarks before we wrap up the show um, I, I would love to know, you know, what, you know, always it's, uh, people have ideas for us to talk about. You want us to talk about certain, uh, old wrestling pay-per-views or wrestling matches or characters that you know, let us know so we can do it for a uh, few other future episodes. But, um, I guess just in closing, um, you know, uh, you can find all our episodes on the beyond retro, uh, Facebook page, uh, on Podbean. Um, all our episodes are on YouTube. Um, to view as well and of course uh, Doug, Nathan, Joe and myself were all available on Facebook 24-7 you send us a message, you know, contact us or like, we would encourage you to like the Beyond Retro Facebook page and just um, you know, continue to support us, you know, we, we know there's a lot of people out there doing podcasts that cover a lot of stuff from the 80s and stuff like that and we want to strive to, you know try to be different try to offer something that, you know you know, in, in, in the richness of discussions that uh, that hopefully people, when the people listen to it, they're on the same level as we are, that they, they, they're they feeling that excitement as you and I are unleashing it here on the podcast. Yes, I absolutely agree. So, well, I wanted to thank everybody that joined us in the chat room, you know, for, you know, all your comments, some of your questions. I hope you guys had fun talking amongst each other as well as listening to us and watching us. And we hope to see you here next week. So, uh, yeah, it was fun having everybody there. So it was a great episode, and I guess we'll see you guys next week then. We'll see you next week.